And welcome to Linux Action News, episode 211, recorded on October 17th, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. With the release of Plasma 5.23 this week, the KDE community is celebrating its 25th birthday. On October 14th, 1996, Matthias Ettrick announced a new project, the Cool Desktop Environment. KDE was launched with a goal, a bold goal to make a desktop for end users and maybe even standardize the Linux desktop somewhat. So picture it. It was a long time ago, back in 96, when KDE launched, a Linux user at the time would need to cobble together maybe a dozen different toolkits and widget sets to get all of the various desktop applications, quote-unquote applications, they needed back in the day. We kind of take it for granted now, because in many ways, they've been successful. We essentially have a predominantly GTK and Qt app ecosystem on the Linux desktop. That's a lot better than a dozen. And now, 25 years later, KDE Plasma 523 looks like something of a special release. As with every recent release, 523 sees much improved Wayland support and gesture support and improved compatibility between Wayland and XWayland applications. And Chris, I know you'll be happy to see this land. Multi-screen layouts are now retained across X11 and Wayland sessions. I'm allowed to do a happy dance over this one, right, Wes? I think so. Mm, 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 this is amazing. Ooh, uh, uh, I'm doing a happy dance right now, if you can't tell. I mean, I legitimately had just written this off as a thing. I figured one of the costs as an end user that was living on the Linux desktop through the X11 to Wayland transition was that I just wouldn't have ideally preserved window arrangement layout saved when I switched display servers. I just, I'd come to accept that. It was a fact of Linux desktop life, and somehow... These crazy Plasma devs have actually solved that problem. In my opinion, that's so huge because it's just a feature I never thought we were going to see, and they delivered it in this edition. Uh, I also know that they just put a gigantic amount of effort into things like the kickoff application launcher and into their application installer, KDE Discover. It's great to see those applications get some work. Indeed. And all that is, of course, among a wide variety of other improvements and fixes throughout Plasma. This is a version of Plasma you could move into for a while. Oh, definitely. You know, um, I've gotten a little bit of hands-on this weekend with the new release. So this is just early impressions from me. Um, and I generally, they evolve over time and, and whatnot. But, you know, I, the one thing that's an obvious trend here is that Plasma has been in a real refinement period for, for a little bit now. And every release has noticeably and quantifiably improve the user experience in sometimes small ways and in sometimes large ways. And it's been on that trajectory now for a while. Plasma 523 doubles down on that trajectory. And on that front, I have to say the new Blue Ocean Breeze theme has brought me back to using a light theme on Plasma. It just does a better job of drawing my eyes to the active elements in the window. And it honestly just has a really professional finished feel to it. And I like the new ability to easily tweak the accent colors. You could kind of do this in Plasma before, but they've made it way easier now. And those kickoff improvements I mentioned, well, they're welcome by me. I mean, it's it, it was needed. I think it needed some TLC. Those improvements were necessary, and they've just knocked them out of the park. They've, they've done a great job. For those of you not familiar, the kickoff menu is like the start menu, if you will, for the Plasma desktop. And so you want that to be well-refined. You want it to look really solid because it's one of the very first things a new user interacts with. And it's one of the things a longtime user will use thousands of times. So these improvements matter a lot. And they nailed it with this release. It just looks better. It works better. And I'd expect Microsoft to rip this off for Windows 12. The Blender project announced Apple has joined their development fund. Apparently in the works for some time, but this week the project made the investment public. Yeah, and along with the news about money, there was also some news about code. The first official patch to Blender was submitted by Apple, and <laughs> surprise, surprise, it's a metal backend for GPU rendering on macOS. But according to the announcement, Apple will also provide ongoing engineering expertise and additional resources to Blender and its broader development community as well. Yeah, this kind of investment seems to be a win-win for everyone. I mean, an important project gets critical funding, and Apple gets support for macOS and gives developers incentive to keep that support first rate. Blender said its development fund accepts donations to, quote, support activities to provide free and open accessible services 
for all Blender contributors, including bug fixing, code reviews, technical documentation, and onboarding. This seems like big news for you macOS users out there. More doors are going to open. This will have broader impacts than just Blender for free software that supports GPU rendering on Apple's SoC. And let's not forget with Blender seeing more comprehensive and broader adoption, all three major desktop platforms will have a compatible open source 3D graphics tool. Igor Seletsky, the CEO of Cloud Linux and the founder of Alma Linux, has announced he is stepping down from the Alma Linux OS Foundation Board. 2021 has been something of a bootstrapping year for the new CentOS alternatives that have popped up. Alma Linux was spun out from Cloud Linux shortly after the CentOS stream transition announcement back in December of 2020. We asked Igor if it was his intention from the start to step down eventually, or if this was in response to some event. He told us, quote, The intention from the start was to make it a well-governed and independent organization that will survive the test of time. Knowing the history of CentOS, which never had any org structure behind it, I knew the governance will be very important. I didn't know which form it will take, but it was always the goal. Igor went on to say that there was no intention for him to be on the board in the first place. In fact, he says, quote, it was more of a necessity. Someone had to do it. Someone had to drive the process forward, invite people, talk to lawyers, figure out the next steps. Uh, he finishes by saying, you would be surprised just how few people want that responsibility. At the end of March, the Alma Linux Foundation was formed to manage the trademarks and, in the words of its bylaws, to, quote, develop and maintain a no-registration, ad-free, stable, open-source Linux distribution. Igor told us, quote, I don't have a sentiment that Alma Linux is mine. It is not. I helped to start it, and I will continue helping it flourish. Yet, I will not be done giving it direction. That is the whole point of it being a community-owned organization. It should be the community that decides what is next, what is okay, and what is acceptable. Here, here. I think to really appreciate how big of a deal this is, especially if you're not a CentOS user, you have to consider how critical the server market is to Linux and how important it is to have a free, enterprise-grade, community-run distribution that actually has broad vendor support. It's absolutely vital. I think it's a key part of the Linux server ecosystem. But it's not just that context, which is already super important. But it's also an important historical milestone for long-term CentOS users because at the core of the issues that plagued CentOS in the past, like the pre-Red Hat days, it was always the knock-on effects of its original ownership structure, if we'll just call it that loosely, and the problems that resulted in losing one of its original founders who who had access to the PayPal account, who had access to the website, had trademarks. It just plagued the project. Yeah, and I think that's the lens with which we should be observing this news. Stepping down from a board like this is a notable move on its own, but for the CentOS community, this is significant. And it's sort of a signal that business continues as normal, Alma Linux shipped their 8.5 beta shortly after this news dropped. And just six days after, Red Hat Enterprise 8.5's beta shipped. That's been a trend, and it's something CentOS users notice. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support this here show. Linode is where we host the services that you use whenever you're downloading a podcast or interacting with us on a regular basis. And one of our secret sauces has really been their object storage. I normally would sit here and tell you about how fast their machines are and how they have 11 data centers and NVMe upgraded disks in their systems and AMD Epic processors for their high-end CPU boxes. But Honestly, I'm finding new uses for object storage all the time. And in the show notes, I'll put a link to a guide that Linode has released to use Plex with object storage. You see where I'm going with that? (laughs) That could be fire right there. And when you go to linode.com slash land, you get $100 to work with here. So you can really try them out. You can go build a system, go deploy your own Jitsi box or something like that, and really get a sense of how fast the boxes are and how clean the dashboard is. And then if you ever need help, They got the best customer support in the business. People that are really going to help you 24-7 by phone, by ticket, or by social. 
And they're often advancing into new areas as well, like bare metal servers is something they're rolling out. DDoS protection, cloud firewalls, these kinds of things that are just super nice to have and make working with Linode even faster. I really appreciate they have image templates, they have stack scripts, and their one-click deployments make it super easy to get started with like a base system that you can build on top of really quick. But let's be honest, one of the best things is their pricing. They're 30 to 50% cheaper than other major cloud providers. That's pretty nice. When you look at the performance, the price, and the fact that you get to support your local friendly Linux action news, that's a pretty nice combination. And then if you get into more advanced stuff, like you need Terraform or Kubernetes support, well, they got, they got that too. They got Kubernetes for days. I mean, Wes is always going on about the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes, and Linode's got that. Go check it out for yourself, though, and take advantage of that $100 and support the show. Linode is dedicated to offering the best in virtualized cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. So sign up today, linode.com slash LAN. Get $100 and support the show. linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. Boy, am I grateful for mobile connectivity today. What a day it is. I'm sure you've had these too, where you've got work stuff and you've got parent stuff. Mobile connectivity is essential. And I am very grateful for Ting's flexibility. You know, I've been a customer since 2013, and the reality is they've been flexible with me the entire time. Here I am today, I'm more of a heavy user on data than I ever was, but in the past I fancied myself as someone who was able to download my podcasts and sync my photos and get things prepared before I left. <laughs> but these days, I'm flying by the seat of my pants more and more, and Ting stayed flexible. Their plans are simple and straightforward. You just go to their website, you see them, they're easy. Go to linux.ting.com, though, because that'll take 25 bucks off. You see, the name of the game here is that Ting's an MBNO. That means that they get to focus on things like customer service and being competitive in the marketplace, and they don't have to focus on digging holes in the ground like the duopolies do, but they get to ride on top of their networks. It's a pretty slick setup, and it gives Ting the flexibility to do things like no contracts and just fantastic pricing, and the best customer support in the business. So go to linux.ting.com to get started. Fill in your information. Ting will give you a SIM card. They'll ship it to you. They'll mail it to you. You know, that kind of thing. You pop it in your phone, and you get off and going in seconds because they got a great dashboard. And if you ever need any help, they got great customer support. Join me on Ting, linux.ting.com. Now I got to get out of here. On Thursday, October 14th, we saw the release of Ubuntu 2110, an LTS interim release with nine months of support and the first to use GNOME 40 for the desktop. Canonical's release announcement focuses on developers, and specifically Windows developers, saying, quote, Windows developers will be delighted with out-of-the-box support for graphical applications on Windows subsystem for Linux, which enables users to enjoy Ubuntu desktop applications without modification. That does give you some indication of the focus of this release. It's, it's developers. And those of us who've been around for a while and have seen some of these releases, we know how this works. The LTS release gets many magnitudes more of users and likely the press coverage, too, than these interim releases do. But this is the land where Canonical traditionally plays. It does interesting work, if not even risky work. Right. You might recall it was way back in the Ubuntu 17.10 release cycle that Canonical tried switching to Wayland by default before ultimately determining, no, that was too early, Wayland isn't ready, and walk that back in 18.04. That's a great example of where they use that interim release to really experiment. And in comparison, I'm pretty underwhelmed with the release of Ubuntu 21.10. And to be clear, this is why we save this for the end of the show this week. This is really more of an opinion piece than it is news. But having reviewed every release of Ubuntu ever, personally, I'm left feeling like Canonical has sort of stopped experimenting with these and the last release as well. There's nothing that we're really trying here. I mean, there's nothing incredibly new. As things stand right now, I basically kind of have to look forward to the LTS for something new. And, well, that's likely going to leave me disappointed. Especially with Ubuntu now falling behind on both GNOME and GTK. They only just now started shipping Pipewire. It's not being used by default. And it's unclear if they'll make the leap to GNOME 42 for their LTS, which will land late in the 2204 cycle. As for the kernel, Linux 5.13, it's definitely solid, but 5.14 has been out for a bit now. 
And we're really starting to see some major important things land in these recent kernels. Staying current right now seems to matter more than ever. Which is why it's kind of a bit ironic that Canonical is positioning this release as one for developers. My thoughts as well. It it is great to see first-class WSL support, and I think it's a very clever move on Canonical's part. And it seems like an investment they're making today that will have future returns. But outside of WSL... What is the specific special sauce Ubuntu is offering developers right now? Is it their out-of-date GTK environment? Their not-so-current kernel? And what's the value for developers who are running the bulk of their applications in containers? It's getting harder and harder to answer that question these days. And when I zoom out and I look at the longer-term trends around Ubuntu as a platform, it seems like it might be becoming less appealing to build on. And let's take a look at the deck. You, you kind of have to wonder, why didn't Valve go with Ubuntu on the deck? After all, the compatibility environment they ship with Steam is, and always has been, I should say, based on Ubuntu. So wouldn't it have just been more straightforward to expand upon that? you got to imagine from a tooling and workflow standpoint, it would have been easier for the development team just to build on that and make the entire device Ubuntu. But instead, they rebased on Arch, which is no small effort. Yeah, I mean, Valve SteamOS developers had to make a choice here with Arch, and one that they would know might mean having to retool and rethink how to build a distro. Something had to motivate a change like that. You have to wonder what was the missing pieces that made Ubuntu not a contender, and it's, it's likely fresher components and drivers and software. And Valve's not the only developer in town that has those requirements. You're left sort of just feeling like Ubuntu has taken their eye off this project a little bit, like it's still got good staff from Canonical working on it. But that top-down driver that's generally needed at Canonical, it, it's hard to say, but it feels like it's missing these days. And maybe it just doesn't have the same level of investment at the corporate level, especially at the top level of the corporation, that it used to. And of course, Canonical will never come out and release a press release that says, we're not quite as interested in the desktop anymore, right? They're going to continue to make a product that their OEMs can use, but they're not going to necessarily advertise that it's a minimum viable effort from a company standpoint. But that's not to say we are not grateful to the developers who do hard work on the Ubuntu desktop and make it what it is. We are very thankful for everything you do. And while these last two rounds of releases have been somewhat underwhelming, the LTS is really the final game. That's true. And the flavors also have a lot to offer. For our complete review and thoughts on those flavors and our other notes, go check out Linux Unplugged 427, where we have a complete review. And just a programming note for next week, the episode will be out just a little bit later than usual. Wes is off to a wedding, not his own, but he's attending a friend's wedding over the weekend, so we'll be out just a bit later. You know what? Just make sure you're subscribed. That way you always get the latest Linux and open source news whenever we have a new release at linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe. And stay in touch, won't you? linuxactionnews.com slash contact. Yeah, don't be a stranger. Also, check out Siegel 2021. Their schedule is published and it's coming up soon. And this year, our local Seattle conference is going online November 5th through the 6th. As for us, we'll be back next week with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>